A subcommittee on the Constitution and Civil Justice will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recesses of the committee at any time. Uh, we've called today's hearing in order to examine the Fraudulent Joinder Prevention Act. This is legislation aimed at addressing an obstacle to the removal of civil litigation from state court to federal court in diversity jurisdiction cases. And I want to thank uh, Representative Ken Buck, a member of the Judiciary Committee, for introducing this legislation. Federal diversity jurisdiction exists when the plaintiff and the defendants to a lawsuit are from different states. According to the Supreme Court, the Constitution has presumed, presumed, whether rightly or wrongly, that state attachments, state prejudices, state jealousies, and state interests might sometimes obstruct or control the regular administration of justice." Unquote. Thus, the Constitution's framers create a diversity jurisdiction to preserve national harmony and promote interstate commerce by ensuring that a lawsuit involving citizens of different states could be litigated in a presumably neutral federal court rather than in a possibly biased state court. In general, under federal, jurisdiction, uh, federal diversity jurisdiction, if a plaintiff from one state files a lawsuit against a defendant from another state in state court, the defendant may have that litigation moved from state court to federal court. However, for more than a century, plaintiffs have attempted to defeat removal in these cases by joining an in-state defendant with no real connection to the underlying claim. In response to these attempts to wrongfully deprive defendants of their right to have their cases heard in federal court, the Supreme Court developed the fraudulent joinder doctrine. But the Supreme Court has not clarified or elaborated on the doctrine since the early 1900s, nor has Congress stepped in to statutorily fill the void. This lack of guidance from the Supreme Court and Congress has led to poorly defined standards and inconsistent interpretations and application of the fraudulent joinder doctrine in the lower federal courts. For instance, if some federal judges require a showing that there is no possibility of recovery against a local defendant in order to keep the case in a federal court. Others require an even more difficult showing that the claim be wholly substantial in, let me say that again, that the claim be wholly insubstantial or frivolous. Still other justices or judges in, insist that a defendant demonstrate there is an, that there is an obvious failure to a state claim against the defendant. All of these approaches and the others that are used are difficult to meet. In fact, current law is so heavily uh, jaded against defendants that, uh, that federal appeals judge J. Harvey Wilkinson recently observed in support of congressional action to change the standards for joinder that, quote, there's a problem with fraudulent jurisdiction law as it exists today, and that is that you have to establish that the joinder of a non-diverse defendant is totally ridiculous and that there's no possibility of ever recovering. That is a sham. That's corrupt. That's very hard to do. The problem is the bar is so terribly high." Unquote. To make the law more fair, the Fraudulent Joinder Prevention Act makes a modest change to existing law to ensure that defendants who are entitled to a federal forum do not have their cases sent back to state court based on unreasonable or inconsistent standards. To accomplish this, the bill simply adds two additional sentences to the statute governing removal. Embodied in these sentences are two basic concepts. First, that federal courts should evaluate fraudulent joinder under one uniform standard, namely whether the plaintiff states a, quote, plausible claim for relief against the non-diverse defendant, and second, that the federal courts are permitted to look at evidence submitted by both the plaintiff and the defendants in making this determination. This legislation will improve the administration of justice in the federal courts, and it will especially help small local businesses and their owners and employees who are currently unfairly pulled into costly lawsuits by trial lawyers simply to keep cases in state court. Small businesses are already overburdened by litigation as it is. They should not be further weighed down by cases to which they have no real connection simply so that an enterprising attorney can game the system. And I look forward to the witnesses' testimony and any comments and suggestions they may have 
with regard to this legislation. And now I would uh, recognize the um, ranking member for his statement. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, you can't claim that this committee just deals with political issues. We don't get into all those meaty things like Planned Parenthood. We take those straight to the floor. We deal with these issues that really could bore the viewing audience to death. Thank you. H.R. 3624, the Fraudulent Joinder Prevention Act of 2015, not even an acronym, should, could more properly be named the Corporate Defendant Forum Shopping Act because it does that as well. It facilitates that in substance. If enacted, this bill could deny plaintiffs the right to pursue state law claims in state court and instead allow defendants to choose where the plaintiff's claims are heard. The plaintiff would not have the option of choosing their court. The bill upends a century, century, that's a long time, of legal doctrine governing how federal court decides whether to remand a case that was removed by an out-of-state defendant on diversity grounds and where there is at least one in-state defendant in the case. Specifically, this bill would require a court to deny a motion to demand, to remand, excuse me, where the plaintiff cannot show that the addition of an in-state defendant to a case is based on a plausible state law claim against the in-state defendant or that the plaintiff has a good faith intention to pursue such a claim against the in-state defendant or seek to seek a joint judgment. The bill also allows a court to consider affidavits or other evidence in making its determination. The bill raises a number of concerns. Firstly, there's no evidence that federal courts have failed to properly address fraudulent joinders. For a hundred years, the federal courts have applied the doctrine of fraudulent joinder, which is an exception to the requirement of complete diversity. Under this doctrine, a federal court may retain jurisdiction based on diversity on citizenship, even when a complaint names an in-state defendant if an out-of-state defendant shows that there is no possibility that the plaintiff would be able to establish a state law claim against the in-state defendant in state court. The party trying to remove the case to federal court, the out-of-state defendant, has the burden of proving that federal diversity jurisdiction is proper. While the standard has been articulated differently by different courts, they all embody the same basic principle that as long as there is any basis for pursuing a claim against an in-state defendant, the federal court must remand the case to state court. Kind of an interesting thing. Normally, some folks on this committee think that the state should come first, that states' rights and best things are ruled better at the local level and the state level. Not in this particular situation, because business is involved, and they prefer that the businesses have the option of getting it out of state court and into federal court. This standard is in keeping with the longstanding judicial recognition that constitutionally, federal courts are courts of limited jurisdictions and should therefore construe removal statutes strictly and narrowly, something you think would be liked by this committee. Tellingly, the Supreme Court has not appeared to consider it a problem that different courts articulate the doctrine of fraudulent joinder differently, nor has it found it a problem with the way the courts have been applying the doctrine to address improper joinder. In short, after a century of application, the court has not deemed it necessary to alter the way the federal courts deal with fraudulent joinder. Secondly, by requiring litigation on the merits at a nascent stage of litigation, the bill will increase the complexity and costs surrounding remand motions, dissuading plaintiffs from pursuing meritorious claims, and add costs to our federal budget, something that our children and grandchildren will have to pay for. That's a quote. H.R. 3624 shifts the burden of proof from defendants to plaintiffs in removal cases based on diversity grounds. It also requires the application of vague and undefined standards, which invites further litigation over the meaning and scope of those standards. For instance, what constitutes a plausible claim is not simply self-evident. We know this because courts have been struggling to apply the plausibility standard with respect to pleadings in federal courts after Ashcroft versus I Iqbal? Iqbal decision applied such a standard to pleadings under the Federal Rules of Procedure 8. That decision has produced a substantial amount of litigation that has led to increased uncertainty, complexity, and litigation costs. There is no reason to think that the same thing will not happen once such a plausibility standard is imported into the remand context as H.R. 3624 proposes to do. Similarly, the bill's required inquiry into a plaintiff's subjective good faith intention will result in increased litigation as the bill does not define the phrase, quote, good faith intention, unquote, and is not used anywhere in Title 28. That the increase in cost and complexity would not only drain limited resources of plaintiffs, but also burden already strained 
federal judicial resources. Finally, this bill offends federalism by denying state courts the ability to shape state law. State courts are the final authorities on state procedural and substance law, and state law claims ought to be left to state courts except in the narrowest circumstances. This bill would further deny state courts that authority by making it easier for federal courts to retain jurisdiction where only state law claims are at issue. H.R. 3624 represents just the latest in a long line of attempts to deny plaintiffs access to state courts and to extend, extend inappropriately the reach of federal courts into state law matters. But it's good that we are not, what is it, the hobgoblin of simple minds? Consistency. We're not con in that terms. We get out of that. So that's a wonderful thing. Those reasons, though, I oppose the bill. And I thank the gentleman, and I now recognize the distinguished chairman of the full committee, Mr. Goodlatte, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, America's small businesses are some of the leading victims of frivolous lawsuits and the extraordinary costs that our legal system imposes. Every day, local business owners have lawsuits filed against them based on claims for which they are ultimately not responsible. These lawsuits impose a tremendous burden on small businesses and on our, our economy as a whole, as America's small businesses are major drivers of the U.S. economy. Just two weeks ago, the House passed the Lawsuit Abuse Reduction Act to help rein in frivolous lawsuits. Enactment of that legislation will help eliminate some of the abuses that exist in the federal legal system that harm small businesses in particular. The bill we are examining today, the Fraudulent Joinder Prevention Act, will also help address a litigation abuse that regularly drags small businesses into court to answer for claims to which they have no real connection. In order to avoid the jurisdiction of the federal courts, plaintiffs' attorneys regularly join in-state defendants to the lawsuits they file in state court, even if the in-state defendants' connections to the controversy are minimal or non-existent. Typically, the fraudulently joined in-state defendant is a small business or the owner or employee of a small business. Ultimately, these in-state defendants may not face any liability as a result of being named as a defendant, but that does not prevent them from having to spend money to hire a lawyer and taking valuable time away from running their businesses to deal with matters related to a lawsuit. Plaintiff's attorneys join these basically unconnected in-state defendants to their lawsuits because the current rules for determining whether fraudulent joinder has occurred provide little disincentive to adding an in-state defendant no matter how frivolous the claim is against that defendant. In fact, the system actually encourages plaintiffs to fight to get their cases sent back to state court once they are removed to federal court by providing that plaintiffs may have their attorney's fees reimbursed if a case is remanded back to state court. The Fraudulent Joinder Prevention Act attempts to bring some balance to the federal court's determination over whether a case that has been removed from state to federal court should remain in federal court. It does this by making a modest change to the statute that governs the fraudulent joinder determination. The change is modest because it merely requires federal judges to apply concepts to the fraudulent joinder determination that they already regularly use in other areas of the law. The bill provides that the standard judges are to use in determining whether a defendant has been fraudulently joined is whether the plaintiff states a plausible claim for relief against an in-state defendant. This plausible claim for relief standard is already used by federal judges in determining whether to grant motions to dismiss. Additionally, the bill allows judges to determine whether the claims against an in-state defendant are made in good faith. Again, judges are already asked in other areas of the law to examine a party's good or bad faith. Nothing in this bill forces a judge to decide issues in favor of a defendant or creates a new standard that federal judges and litigants are not already familiar with. I look forward to the witness's testimony on this common sense legislative proposal and any suggestions that, may have, that they may have for ways this legislation can be improved. Finally, I want to thank Representative Buck for introducing this bill to help level the playing field for defendants when questions regarding fraudulent joinder arise. And I yield back. And I thank the gentleman and would now yield to the ranking member of the committee, Mr. Conyers from Michigan. I want to thank the chairman uh, and uh, welcome all the witnesses. Uh, as with the class action Fairness Act, 
once again we consider legislation really designed to deny access to justice for potentially millions of plaintiffs seeking relief under state law in state court. Uh, this uh, so-called Fraudulent Joinder Prevention Act would flip on its head the century-old standard governing when a federal court must remand cases alleging only state law claims back to state court when uh, where there is at least one in-state defendant in the case. Specifically, uh, we amend in this bill Section 1447C of Title 28 to require a federal court when considering a motion uh, for remand in a case that was removed from a state court to federal court on diversity grounds and where there's also an in-state defendant to deny such remand motion if the plaintiff has not demonstrated that there is a, quote, plausible claim for relief against, uh, uh, end quote, an in-state defendant or that the plaintiff had a good faith intention to prosecute the action against each in-state defendant or to seek a joint judgment. There are three problems raised with the measure before us. The first, of course, is that the bill attempts to solve a non-existent problem. The doctrine of fraudulent, of fraudulent joinder, which federal courts have been applying, as has been already remarked for more than a century, governs when a federal court may ignore for the purpose of retaining jurisdiction, an in-state defendant in a state law case that's been removed to federal court solely on diversity grounds. The bill's proponents claim that this legislation is necessary because the fraudulent joinder doctrine has been articulated differently by different courts, yet these are basically distinctions without a difference. All courts must consider whether there is some basis in law and fact for a plaintiff to pursue a claim against an in-state defendant. If there is, then the federal court must remand the case to back, remand the case back to state court. If uniformity were truly the concern of the bill's proponents, the legislation would simply pick one of the existing articulations of the fraudulent joinder standard and codify it into law. Instead, it is clear from the bill's radical changes to longstanding jurisdictional practice that the true purpose of this measure is simply to stifle the ability of plaintiffs to have their choice of forum and possibly even their day in court. In addition, the bill would sharply increase the cost of litigation for plaintiffs and increase the resource burdens on federal courts. The bill requires a court to engage in a substantial merits inquiry at a case's initial procedural stage without the benefit of any substantial discovery. This requirement would undoubtedly generate more uncertainty, more costs, and more unnecessary complexity at such an early stage of the litigation. Moreover, the bill shifts the burden of proof on a motion to remand from the defendant to the plaintiff, even though it is the defendant that is seeking the remand. The bill also applies a vague, open-ended uh, 
plausible claim standard. What constitutes a plausible claim is an open question in the remand context and would necessarily require substantial litigation and the corresponding development of a substantial body of case law. Similarly, the bill invites substantial litigation by requiring a showing of the plaintiff's subjective good faith intention to pursue a claim against an in-state defendant. Like plausibility, the bill does not define the term good faith intention, and such a phrase is not used anywhere else in Title 28 where the bill's amendments would be codified. All of this will have the cumulative effect of sharply increasing litigation costs for plaintiffs, possibly to the point where those with meritorious claims could be dissuaded from even filing suit. And it will strain the already limited resources of the federal judiciary. And finally, the amendments made by this bill would raise fundamental federalism concerns. Removal of a state court case to federal court always implicates federalism concerns. That's why the federal courts generally disfavor federal jurisdiction and read removal statutes narrowly. By applying a sweeping and vaguely worded new standard to the determination of when a state court may be removed to federal court, the bill will deny state courts the ability to decide and ultimately to shape state laws. With many similar measures, this bill violates our fundamental constitutional structure by intruding deeply into state sovereignty. And so I accordingly uh, look forward to hearing the views of our witness today with respect to my concerns. And I thank the chair. And I thank the gentleman. And without further objection, other members' opening statements will be made part of the record. And I will now introduce our witnesses. Our first witness is Elizabeth Melito. Ms. Melito served as Senior Executive Counsel with the National Federation of Independent Business Small Business Legal Center, a position that she has held since March of 2004. She's responsible for managing cases and legal work for the Small Business Legal Center and has testified before Congress on numerous occasions on the impact regulations and the civil justice system have on small business. Ms. Melito previously worked as a trial attorney and has an extensive background in tort, medical, malpractice, employment, and labor law. Welcome. Our second witness is Lonnie Hoffman. Professor Hoffman is the associate dean and uh, law found, uh, is the associate dean and law foundation professor at the University of Houston Law Center. He's a specialist on procedural law in federal courts and state courts, and has authored numerous law review articles. Uh, Professor Hoffman has testified before Congress and lectured around the world on civil litigation subject. He's a member of the Supreme Court of Texas Rules Advisory Committee and Editor-in-Chief of The Advocate, a quarterly journal published by the litigation section of the State Bar of Texas. Welcome, sir. Our final witness is Carrie Silverman, uh, a partner at the law firm Shook, Hardy, and Bacon in Washington, D.C. Mr. Silverman's public policy work focuses on civil justice reform, and he has published over 25 articles in prominent law journals. He regularly authors amicus briefs on behalf of national businesses, uh, trade, and other advocacy groups in cases before the U.S. Supreme Court and state high courts. Mr. Silverman has testified before Congress and most state legislatures and is an adjunct professor at the George Washington University uh, Law School. Now, each of the witnesses' written statements will be entered into the record in its entirety. And I would ask that each of you uh, summarize uh, your testimony in five minutes or less. Uh, to help you stay within that time, there is a timing light in front of you. 
The light will switch from green to yellow, indicating that you have one minute to conclude your testimony. When the light turns red, it indicates that the witnesses' five minutes have expired. And so before I recognize the witnesses, it is the tradition of the subcommittee that they be sworn. So if you'd please stand to be sworn. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Well, please be seated. Uh, let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. And I now recognize our first witness, Ms. Melito, and if you make sure that microphone's turned on. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, Chairman Franks, Ranking Member Cohen, and distinguished committee members. I'm happy to he appear here today on behalf of the National Federation of Independent Business, which represents more small businesses than any other organization. Because litigation entails angst and great expense for small businesses, NFIB is pleased to see this committee's attention focused on the issue of fraudulent joinder. Fraudulent joinder remains a source of confusion and unnecessary litigation in our courts and impacts far too many innocent small businesses. The situation unfolds as follows. Plaintiff's attorneys will name a small business, such as a local pharmacy or insurance agent, with little connection to the complaint in order to deny the federal courts of jurisdiction. In many instances, the plaintiff has no intention of imposing liability on the fraudulently joined party. With courts divided over the standard for finding that a defendant is fraudulently joined, the small business is forced to engage in protracted litigation when all they want is to be dismissed from the case entirely. Public policy should encourage plaintiff's attorneys to prudently assess the viability of their client's potential claims before initiating a lawsuit and discourage plaintiffs from taking unfounded or improvidently cavalier positions. Along these lines, we should aim to create strong disincentives against naming a small business as a defendant in a case where the claim against the business is particularly weak. Per this is especially so where the plaintiff's apparent motive in naming the defendant is to use the defendant as a body shield against invocation of federal jurisdiction, or what is also referred to as fraudulent joinder. But unfortunately, as the law currently stands, plaintiffs actually have a perverse incentive to bring weak or attenuated claims against small business defendants for the sake of defeating federal jurisdiction. Given the tremendous cost of litigation, and the inevitable risk that a plaintiff might prevail if the case goes before a sympathetic jury or an errant judge, we must also address the reality that small business defendants are rationally discouraged from vindicating their rights. And so long as this remains true, plaintiff's attorneys will inevitably weigh the benefit of pursuing a questionable defendant as outweighing the risks. Accordingly, NFIB supports the Fraudulent Joinder Prevention Act, which would provide greater clarity in the law and removal and reduce litigation. It would accomplish these things by requiring that a federal court considering a motion for remand determine whether the complaint states a plausible claim for relief against the non-diverse defendant. This language would eliminate the current legal standards that strongly favor plaintiff's motions for remand. The court would also be able to consider whether the plaintiff has a good faith intention to prosecute the action against the non-diverse defendant or to seek judgment against the non-diverse defendant. This bill is straightforward and offers a simple and common sense fix for a problem that has generated much confusion and unnecessary litigation in federal courts at the expense of small businesses. On behalf of America's small business owners, I thank the subcommittee for holding this hearing and inviting me to testify. I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Ms. Melito. And I would now recognize our second witness, Mr. Hoffman, and if you make sure that microphone's on. Yes, sir. How's that? Better? Chairman Franks, Ranking Member Cohen, members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify today. I have three brief but important points I want to make that I hope everyone on the committee will consider as they're considering this legislation. I hope in particular proponents of the bill will consider them seriously. First, as Representatives Cohen and Conyers have already pointed out, there is no need for this bill. Fraudulent joinder law is well settled, but I want to expand on that point a bit further. Under fraudulent joinder law today, while it is certainly true that the defendant has a heavy burden to meet to show that fraudulent joinder exists, which is as it should be, that burden is hardly insurmountable. 
For every story of a non-diverse defendant found to have been properly joined, I can cite an equal number where the court found that the plaintiff's claim had no reasonable basis under the substantive law. This makes a couple of things clear, and the first, I think, is that we should be wary against legislating by anecdote. It also suggests that for those who support the bill, their real beef isn't with fraudulent joinder law or with the way that judges apply it. Instead, it's with the substantive law itself that this Congress and state legislatures have enacted to protect citizens. Courts find fraudulent joinder when the substantive law allows recovery, and they find, I'm sorry, excuse me, when the substantive law allows recovery, they find joinder proper, and they find fraudulent joinder when it does not. There is no need to change fraudulent joinder law. If proponents are unhappy with the substantive law, then that's what they need to be talking about. Of course, they're not because they know there's not a lot of political support for taking away substantive rights. And so it turns out to be much easier to talk about technical procedural reform. Which brings me to the second point I want to make. Whatever one thinks about current law, this bill would not achieve the uniformity that is supposedly desired. One problem is, as noted earlier, the bill would force courts to determine what the word, quote, plausible means. This is very hard to do. And we already know this. We don't have to guess because of the Supreme Court's plausibility cases, the Bell Atlantic versus Twombly case from 2007 and the Ashcroft versus Iqbal case from 2009. These cases have spawned decisions from the lower courts almost too numerous to count. Do you know that last week the count on Iqbal was that there were 85,000 cases that had cited it. It had become the number one most cited case in the history of all cases being cited, and that's in less than six years. The record holder that it replaced had held that position, but it took it 25 years to get there, the um, Anderson versus Liberty Lobby case. And this deluge of cases applying the court's ambiguous plausibility test hasn't brought uniformity to pleading law. Instead, what counts as plausible varies often greatly from circuit to circuit. In addition to having to figure out what plausible means, courts would also have to determine what the plaintiff's good faith was. But how in the world is a district judge to figure out the plaintiff's good or bad faith only 30 days after a lawsuit has been filed, which is when the remand hearing typically takes place? Like plausibility, this good faith requirement is certain to lead to years of litigation, which is only going to make litigation more expensive, as Representative Cohen has already pointed out for everyone, though I would highlight in particular for plaintiffs. Which brings me to the third and final point I want to make. Though the bill is only a page and a half long, there should be no misunderstanding that the proposed amendments would dramatically alter existing law. All other subject matter jurisdiction doctrines that exist today, all others, recognize that any merits inquiry at the jurisdictional stage should be limited. For example, to show that a plaintiff hasn't met the minimum amount in controversy, the defendant bears a heavy burden of showing, quote, to a legal certainty that the claim is really for less than 75,000 bucks. This same approach is taken with regard to federal question jurisdiction. Only a showing by the defendant that the plaintiff's claim is, quote, wholly insubstantial and frivolous will dismissal be warranted. Thus, jurisdictional law consistently recognizes that judges are ill-equipped to conduct the kind of exhaustive merits inquiries at the very outset of a case that this bill would urge before there's been an opportunity for the facts to come out through discovery. So, in sum, this legislative body should recognize, I hope, the collective judicial wisdom that fraudulent joinder law reflects and resist legislating technical procedural reforms. Instead, I want to submit, it should recall the advice given by a former solicitor general who, when testifying against a bill a few years ago that would have reversed the court's plausibility decisions, the Twombly and the Iqbal decisions I mentioned earlier, advised that legislators should leave procedure to the rule makers. That's what General Garr told the Senate Judiciary Committee, and I submit that that advice is worth remembering today. Thank you, Chairman. And I thank the gentleman. And we will now recognize our third witness, Mr. Silverman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Cohen, and, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today on behalf of the U.S. Chamber and the Institute for Legal Reform. The current process by which courts decide fraudulent joinder is in need for reform.
The doctrine is intended to secure the Constitution's promise of a neutral federal forum in lawsuits involving citizens of different states. Instead, it routinely allows for manipulation and gamesmanship. Such lawsuits have a toll on people who are sued solely to keep a case in state court. It also deprives litigants of an impartial forum, sending cases to local courts where the deck may be stacked against them. And for the judiciary, it has resulted in confusion and unnecessary litigation. Let me briefly explain how this works. Plaintiffs' lawyers typically want to litigate their cases in state court. That's understandable. They have an advantage there. They're likely familiar with the judges and the trial court's local procedures. And as the founders recognized, there's a danger that local courts may inherently favor local plaintiffs, and that remains as true today as it did then. As you explained, Mr. Chairman, when each of the defendants is from a state different from each of the plaintiffs, there is complete diversity. A defendant can then remove the case from state to federal court. It's easy, however, for a plaintiff's lawyer to destroy complete diversity. All he needs to do is name a local person or business as a defendant, one from the same state as the plaintiff. The plaintiff typically has no intention of actually litigating that claim or seeking a judgment against that person. When it's remanded, that person will likely be dismissed. The only reason that the person's included is to block the federal court from hearing the case. As my prepared testimony shows, this tactic often involves naming people such as local managers, salespeople, insurance claims adjusters, or others who are not typically personally liable as a defendant when the real target is their employer. It involves naming local retailers, often family businesses, that have nothing to do with how a product was designed when the real target was the manufacturer. It involves naming uh, local pharmacies that may have sold a drug but had no involvement in developing its labeling or warnings when the real target is the pharmaceutical maker. Fraudulent joinder uh, provides federal courts with the ability to ignore the presence of a local defendant when it is named in a lawsuit only to defeat federal jurisdiction. There's two problems, however, with fraudulent joinder, which brings us to this bill today. The first is that federal courts are all over the map as they, how they decide it. My prepared testimony outlines five different approaches courts have taken. There's the no possibility of a claim or recovery approach, which is what one federal circuit refers to as the no glimmer of hope standard. There is the wholly insubstantial and frivolous approach, which seems akin to federal rule 11, also an extremely high standard. There are some courts that consider whether there is an obvious failure to state a claim. There are others that consider whether there is a reasonable basis for, for the claim or a reasonable possibility of success. Other courts simply consider whether the plaintiff does indeed state a claim, taking an approach similar to an ordinary motion to dismiss and that which is provided in the bill. The courts take, uh, also significantly vary on the evidence they'll consider and if they'll consider at all whether the plaintiff has a good faith intent to seek a judgment against the local defendant. So the first problem is confusion in the law. The second is that these standards range from nearly impossible to very difficult to meet. This is the case even when the claim against the local defendant is extraordinarily weak. The Fraudulent Joint Prevention Act will help bring clarity to the law, reduce gamesmanship and litigation, and preserve access to a neutral federal forum. The bill does so by adopting a uniform approach, requiring a plaintiff to state a plausible claim against the local defendant. This is a standard regularly applied by federal courts when deciding a motion to dismiss. It's a modest tweak to the standard for fraudulent joinder. It does not expand diversity jurisdiction. It's balanced. A plaintiff still gets the benefit of the doubt. Nor does it dictate any re results or tilt a judge's discretion on removal one way or the other. Rather, the bill will clarify that judges have broad discretion to consider evidence when deciding fraudulent joinder, such as affidavits submitted by either party, or whether there's a good faith intent to seek recovery from the local defendant. The result will be a more realistic assessment of whether a plaintiff has stated a viable claim against a local defendant and intends to pursue a judgment against that person. Plaintiffs with legitimate claims against a local defendant will be able to litigate in state court, and out-of-state defendants that show there is no viable claim against the local defendant will be able to have the lawsuit decided in a neutral federal forum. Thank you again for holding this hearing and inviting me to, testimony, to tes testify today. I welcome your questions. Thank you, Mr. Silverman. Thank you all for your testimony. We will now proceed under the 
five-minute rule with questions, and I will begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. My first question is to you, Ms. Melito. Uh, in his written uh, testimony, Professor Hoffman discusses the cost that he argues this bill may impose upon plaintiffs and the courts. Could you please uh, elaborate further on the very real cost that the current fraudulent joinder standard imposes on American small businesses? Yes, thank you very much for that question. In my remarks, I noted that the litigation brings great angst and expense to small business owners. And um, in my time at NFIB, which is now over 10 years, I talk with business owners um, too often who are named as a defendant in a lawsuit. And my discussions with them mirror the findings that the Small Business Administration found in the study they conducted a few years ago to determine what is the real impact of litigation on small businesses. And they found there's really four things. There's financial expense, there's an emotional expense, um, there's changes to how a business operates, including awareness, unfortunately, that develops with their customers. I and mean, I find this when I talk with business owners, too. It's who do we trust anymore? Who's going to be, you know, are they going to target us? Who's, who's the customers that I can trust there, too? Um, and then the final thing, and this is a very real concern with small businesses in this day and age of social media, is damage to the business's reputation. And that goes back, too, to the financial cost, but it's kind of a separate thing, too. There's real damage to a business's reputation when they're named as a defendant in litigation, you know, alongside of, say, you know, a big pharmaceutical company, and then you have, you know, the local drugstore name, too. It makes the papers, and that is a real concern for small business owners. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Silverman. Um, in his testimony, Professor Hoffman asserts that fraudulent joinder law is applied uniformly with some minor variances based on semantics. Uh, do you agree with the, that, that the st standard federal judges apply um, to decide the fraudulent joinder question is uniform across the federal courts and that any difference between the standard applied is merely semantics. Mr. Chairman, I would respectfully disagree. Um, what I've seen in my research is, is uh, even in, within a federal circuit, uh, the standard varies significantly from case to case. Even as many courts seem to follow the no possibility of a claim approach, those same courts go on to define that possibility very differently whether it's a reasonable possibility, absolutely no possibility, or no glimmer of hope. And some, some are looking at it in the plain way of whether there is actually a, a, a claim at all. I don't think it's just semantics. I think there's a great amount of variation that leads, and I think the evidence shows, leads to different results. My prepared testimony cites at least three law review articles that provide, uh, that recognize these significant variations and that they're a problem. I also believe that Professor Arthur Hellman of the University of Pittsburgh School of Law has submitted prepared testimony that agrees with that assessment. Well, let me follow up. Uh, the, the Fraudulent uh, Joinder Prevention Act essentially makes three changes regarding a federal court's fraudulent joinder determination. And number one, it permits judges to look at affidavits and other evidence. Uh, it creates a uniform, plausible claim standard, and it requires that plaintiffs act in good faith when joining defendants to their lawsuits. Do these three changes create new legal concepts or are they all based on concepts that federal judges, federal judges are familiar with? All, all of these concepts are firmly rooted in U.S. Supreme Court jurisprudence that goes, some of which goes back 100 years. Um, these are concepts from existing law. Um, the, uh, first, as to the plausibility standard, as we've discussed today, this is the same standard that federal courts now routinely apply to determine whether a complaint states a viable claim when there is a motion to dismiss. It's a standard set by the U.S. Supreme Court that is now well understood and every day is being applied in cases. It doesn't surprise me, uh, as uh, the professor has stated, about there's 85,000 cases citing this case because it comes up in every single time there's a motion to dismiss and courts know what to do with it. As to the affidavits and other evidence, this is more a clarification or codification of existing law than a change. Most courts are already considering these materials when deciding fraudulent joinder. Uh, with respect to good faith, the Supreme Court has said in cases dating back to 1921 and 1931 that courts, when deciding fraudulent joinder, can look at the good faith uh, in bringing a claim against that local defendant and seeking a judgment. Um, this would just codify that and clarify that it applies because not all courts are looking at it. Well, thank you, Mr. Silverman. I'm now going to recognize the ranking member for five minutes for his questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Professor Hoffman, you uh, 
teach uh, at the University of Houston Law School. I do. I have recently stepped down as the associate dean, so I do, should clarify the chairman's remarks. A happy change. I'm no longer the associate dean, and uh, now I get to return just to my regular life and not take care of everybody else's. <laughs> You're the John Boehner of Houston. <laughs> yes. Uh, when you go back to your class, what will you tell them about this hearing and the law that we discussed and the reasons why you think this even came to a hearing in the United States Congress? So the issues that we talk about are exactly the issues that we talk about every day in my course, um, subject matter, removal, um, pleading standards. I mean, every, every one of these we either have talked about or are on the syllabus to talk about. Um, this is very familiar law. Um, uh, as I tried to indicate in my remarks, specifically on fraudulent joinder, um, uh, in terms of how old it is, um, courts have been applying it for a long time, and with thousands of cases, it should come as no surprise that there are variances in language. Um, I quote a Fifth Circuit case, for instance, uh, that even goes out of its way to point out that just within that one circuit, uh, some of the courts say no possibility, as, as Mr. Silverman pointed out, and others say things like, you know, no reasonable basis or, you know, no, no reasonable uh, possibility. And then the Fifth Circuit goes on to say those standards are interchangeable. Um, and so maybe the thing to really drive home here is the same thing I drive home with my students, uh, which is that uh, procedure drives uh, many outcomes in cases, sometimes positively, sometimes negatively. Um, the concern that we should always have whenever we reform procedure or try to think about making reforms is whether in doing so we're changing the balance of power in some way that makes it harder. And what I fear is that in a circumstance like this, where the real issue is the, is the substantive law, as I indicated earlier, that we're really focused in the wrong place. And again, just to make one other point about that to make sure that that point is clear, um, regardless of what the semantic uh, uh, standard is, Representative Cohen, I I with fraudulent joinder, what really happens is uh, when courts find that the substantive law provides a right for relief, they find there's no fraudulent joinder and they send it back. And conversely, when they find that there is no, no reasonable chance of recovery because the law doesn't provide a right to recover, they find appropriately that fraudulent joinder has occurred. Um, and so the action is in the substantive law. If you were to read 100 cases, I would submit that you know, I don't want to say 100 out of 100, but almost all of them are going to break exactly as I say. And so it, it raises a nice lesson for students that procedure, unfortunately or fortunately, can be important because of the power that goes in and goes behind a lot of these procedural rules. Thank you. Ms. Melito, if you were a student in Professor Hoffman's class, what would you ask him about this? And when he explains that there's really no need for a change in the law, that it's all based on the substance of law, then why would there be even be a need to have this law to help small business? I would ask him about, if you will, vindicating the rights of the small business owners, the defendants in the case who are for, as I've been told by a member, wrongly accused in an action. And how can we more efficiently get to that no reasonable chance of recovery finding? Is there a way that we can get to the finding that Mr. Professor Hoffman just referred to quicker and in a more efficient manner in our courts without getting to discovery because there is one thing you learn in civil procedure. Discovery can go on for a long time and it can be very expensive. Um, and the small business owners who I hear from who believe they are wrongly accused don't want to get to that stage of litigation. They want to get out. So that would be my question to the professor. And professor, would you respond to her now? So I obviously I don't agree with the substance, but I thought she said it very well, and if you were in my class, I would have given you an A. Mr. Silverman <coughs> asked, said that there's a whole lot of differences in the, in the different districts on this issue. Aren't there a lot of differences in districts on other issues as well? S certainly, and again... How does those normally get resolved? Um, the cases percolate through the system. They eventually make it, enough of them make it to the uh, circuit courts, to the intermediate courts of appeals. Um, sometimes there is agreement within those courts, sometimes there isn't. When there isn't, once in a blue moon, the Supreme Court takes, uses one of its very, very few, right, it only hears about 70 cases a year nowadays, so it can't resolve all these issues, but occasionally it does. Um, I mean, plausibility is a good example of that. I mean, the, this notion that we're doing it a lot and therefore we know what we're doing um, 
uh, really, I, I, I think, respectfully misses the mark. I mean, and if you think about it, I mean, even, even if we don't sort of engage in an empirical debate about what is or isn't going on in the lower courts, I mean, just look at the word, plausible. I mean, what, what does it mean for something to be plausible? I mean, again, going back to my class, I can tell you that if my students were here to testify, they would tell you that they are utterly baffled uh, by what this standard is that the court has announced. And, and it really got announced out of whole cloth. I mean, the, 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 the test that Twombly announced in 2007 was essentially a brand new test, and certainly for as a matter of pleading standards was new. And the courts are struggling to figure this out. And there isn't any reason to think that for plausibility, as well as for this business about good faith, that it would come out any differently if we were to incorporate it into remand law. And by the way, just one other point about good faith. You know, th uh, there, there's a nice lesson here. In 2011, Congress passed uh, the, what's the JVCA, the, the Jurisdiction and Venue Clarification Act. And one of the changes that it made, an interesting kind of point of comparison here, is they amended 1446. It used to be that a defendant could only r remove a diversity case if it was within one year of when it had been commenced. But then there were some plaintiffs who once in a while played games and maybe would di di you know, dismiss the non-diverse defendant 366 days later. And so the law got amended to say you could look at the plaintiff's bad faith after the case had been on file for a year, you know, bad faith in kind of keeping the case from being removed. And the um, Congress uh, amended the law to put bad faith in there. But it's after a year has gone by. I mean, in other words, it gives the district judge a chance to sit back and say, you know, has the plaintiff been... Uh, pursuing discovery equally against the non-diverse and diverse defendant. If they haven't, right, if they've basically been ignoring the non-diverse defendant, it's some pretty good evidence that maybe they aren't really targeting them. But what this bill does is it says literally in the first inning of the game, but even before the innings ended, 30, 30 days into the case, the district judge is supposed to figure out what good faith the, defend, the plaintiff had. And that isn't a standard that we know and it's one that I submit is going to cause a great deal of confusion. Well, thank you for your testimony. And in spite of that fact, I'm still going to hope that Greg Ward has a bad game when he plays Memphis. <laughs> <laughs> so noted. I thank the gentleman. And I now yield to the gentleman from Iowa for his questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate being recognized. I appreciate the testimony of the witnesses and the, and the trouble that you take to help inform this Congress. I, as I listen to the testimony here this morning, I have a couple of questions along the way. I direct first to Mr. Hoffman, and that, as I as I listen to your testimony, uh, one of the one of the points you made is that we need to be aware of legislating by anecdote, and uh, it's one of my concerns too. Um, I, when I was first elected to state office, I was I fell prey to that myself. And when it was pointed out to me that you can't fix every problem by legislation, it's one of the few times that I heard someone say something that immediately changed my mind on the spot. Uh, so uh, that matters. Uh, however, you also mentioned that you could show as many cases on the opposite side of this argument. And so anecdote matched up against anecdote. Where's the preponderance of the anecdotes, in your opinion? Um, so I think it is right, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm glad you asked me that question. Um, it, the standard is a high standard, and so it is uh, certainly more often the case, and depending on the circuit, sometimes much more often the case, that a defendant who, a non-diverse defendant who's been named is found not to have been fraudulently joined, and, and so the motion to remand is granted. My point is only to, is to say, it, it's a big litigation system. It's a big country. We have lots of cases. And I have no doubt that there are cases where judges have made a mistake on one side. My point is only that there are just as many. And I'm, I'm happy to give examples. But again, to, to your point, it, 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 there's a danger if, if we focus only on the examples. Yeah, I think instead, I'd, I'd go this way with it, is that we're talking about justice here on the Judiciary Committee. And when we talk about justice, it's not something we do weigh as far as um, the, the preponderance of the anecdotes that we have. It should be what what is the what is the best thing we can do to bring out the maximum amount of justice and equity. And I, I'm one of those people that I forbid my staff to use the word fair, which I didn't notice anybody using this morning because you can't define that. It's got multiple uh, utilizations in code, but I don't. There's no consistent definition of fair. So we should be providing justice and equity. What provides justice and equity? Uh, the other two witnesses would argue this bill does. You argue that it, it's, it's, uh, it's too complex and we should trust the collective judicial wisdom. And 
that's a little bit harder to swallow here in the aftermath of some of the Supreme Court decisions that have come down lately, the collective judicial wisdom. But I, I would just um, make the point that I, I don't hear anyone testifying that there's any reservations about Congress's constitutional authority to write these regulations. There's no one among the panel that would make that case, is there? Uh, no, the only point to the extent that I've made one, Representative King, I I in my written testimony, I didn't say anything today, is I think there are concerns about the federalism issues because of the nature of, 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 of what happens. But I want to be clear um, in that I, I don't think there's, a, for example, an Article Three issue involved here as to okay. the kind of the scope. And that, that of was my point. I, I just wanted to establish that we don't have a disagreement on Article Three authority. We do not. Uh, uh, and, and I certainly agree. But the, you made another point about the definition of the word plausible that it's not defined and uh, so isn't it true that under current practice then plausible is defined by each judge that would be the some of the essence of your testimony as I understand it is the only thing I'll add is and in reference to your last remarks um, uh, despite perhaps your fear of the collective judicial wisdom the Supreme Court in both Twombly and Iqbal advised us that plausibility is to determined by a judge's judicial wisdom and common sense which means they know it when they see it so perhaps um, proponents of the bill should pause. I think you do get my point on that <laughs> Mr. Hoffman. so um, let me make another point then while we have an opportunity here I have with me um, a quote uh, from fourth uh, fourth circuit judge J Harvey Wilkinson which you apparently are familiar with recently observed this uh, with regard to the um, the joinder issue, there is a problem. Quote: There is a there is a problem with fraudulent jurisdiction law as it exists today, and that is that you have to establish that the joinder of a non-diverse defendant is totally ridiculous, and that there's no possibility of ever recovering. That it's a sham. That it's corrupt. That's very hard to do. The problem is the bar is so terribly high. Close quote. Don't we have um, don't we have the presumption in the favor of the fraudulent uh, the fraudulent defendants that would join this, and isn't the burden too high? And you said it's complex, and there are there are anecdotes on either side of this, but in the end, if we're after justice and equity, if it gets to be a burden to litigate through that, and and, and we the argument to simplify our system doesn't argue necessarily in favor of justice. Uh, would you agree with that? Um, thank you for your question. Let me see if let me see if I can try to answer it this way. First of all, in terms of Judge Wilkinson's remarks, I, I don't know when they were made, whether he was speaking to a Federalist Society group or whether he was, you know, I, I suspect it's not from a judicial opinion. Um, um, obviously, we know there are many, many judicial opinions. I mean, it's valid almost point. count. count. So, so I just don't mm -hmm. know. So I can't, I can't speak to it. Um, in, in terms of the substantive part of your question, Representative King, m my answer to you, I think, um, and I'll try to be brief, very, very brief on this, is really to track what I said before. Um, the, the pro to the extent that there's an issue, and I, I submit there isn't, but to the extent that this committee or proponents of the bill think there's an issue, the issue doesn't lie with fraudulent joinder law or with how judges are applying it in their particular places, but rather it is with the substantive law. And what again, what I meant by that, and just to expound that point, the way, regardless of how the, the standard is, whether it's, it's no possibility, reasonable possibility, wh whatever it is for figuring out whether a defendant has been improperly joined, the, the cases turn almost exclusively on this question of whether or not the law allows recovery. And so I'll give you, I, I, this is not to legislate by anecdote, but I'll just give you one example to try to put some meat on the bones of what I'm trying to say. So there was a case out of Mississippi just a couple of years ago where there was a woman who was in a nursing home and terrible things happened to her. She was deprived of water. She had multiple falls and bruises. And so anyway, she ends up suing the, the nursing home and she also sues the administrators, the folks who are running the home. Uh, and they're, of course, the non-diverse defendants. So the administrators bring a, 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 a motion saying, you know, you know they re remove it, and, and, and in response to the motion to remand, they say, we were fraudulently joined. And their argument is, they say, um, because we can't be held liable unless we actually were the ones who physically touched, physically injured the plaintiff. And what the court ends up ruling is that fi under Mississippi law, physical injury is not the only requirement for holding a supervisor liable. And so the, the point is, to the extent there's an issue, they may have a beef with Mississippi law. Maybe it goes too far, maybe it doesn't, but it's not a fraudulent joinder issue.
Well, in, uh, I'm not disagreeing with the point that's in the heart of that and recognizing that the clock has wound down. I have other curiosities about this I'll, uh, I'll seek to examine, but I want to thank all the witnesses and the chairman and you'll back the balance of my time. And I thank the gentleman, and I suppose when it comes to plausibility, we can explain it to the judges, but perhaps we can't understand it for them as well. <coughs> um, this concludes today's hearing, and uh, thanks to all of our witnesses for attending. Uh, without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. And again, I, I thank the witnesses, I thank the members, and I thank the audience. This hearing is adjourned.